All right, thanks. Yeah. All right. All right, today I'll talk to you about our um, approach to analyze epigenetic data. And um, as you said, my name is Jens Lichtenberg. I'm from the NIH, the uh, National Human Genome Research Institute. And um, I started working in this field of epigenetics a couple of years ago. And um, there were some interesting things we determined that were needed from a computational perspective. A little bit of background about um, epigenetics. So essentially what we're looking for um, is the um, epigenetics describes the heritab uh, heritable changes in the genome um, activity that cannot really be attributed to active changes in, um, in the DNA. So you're not looking for, for mutations, insertions, things like that, but you're looking for small additions um, that change the structure. And a um, particular focus in, in our lab is uh, the study of uh, DNA methylation, so rather punctuated mod uh, modifications that um, directly impact uh, your, your genomic structure and um, gene expression. And we're also looking at histone modifications, which is sort of the other end of the spectrum where we look at um, long-range modifications that um, impact what areas of the, um, of the genome are accessible for um, uh, transcription. And what we, what we saw when we got into, into this field is that there's a, a large variety of um, approaches that give you all kinds of data. They um, generally work with uh, sequencing data um, as well as array data. What we focus on here is um, sequencing data. And when we looked at um, the analysis approaches, so we, we can generate um, tons of data, but there was very little in terms of large-scale comprehensive analysis so that sort of focuses on the problem we touched in um, on the keynote. But um, what we saw with, the, with all these analysis processes is that there's um, common threads in the evaluation. And um, these common threads were replicated throughout a, a large number of tools for each of the processes. And in order to, to understand that a little bit better, um, we needed to understand um, the background for, for epigenetic, uh, data, uh, epigenetic um, experiments. So we had to look at um, next generation sequencing. That's generally what you see with NGS. Um, makes it a lot easier. So what you see with that when you have um, epigenetic data uh, or the, the process of generating epigenetic data is um, generally that you have to prepare a library, you have to generate clusters, then you can go into the sequencing process and that gives you your, um, your sort of your, your reads which you then can assemble or align as we, we saw earlier. And there's a, a bunch of different um, methodologies, different approaches, so you have um, uh, approaches that deal with um, the discovery of single nucleated polymorphisms, um, not really too much into the epigenetic parts. You have um, insertions, deletions, and so on. But you can also have um, a, a large field for epigenetics is um, uh, chip sequencing, bus sulfide sequencing, and um, that's where you essentially have a small antibodies that you um, pull down after they attach to sequences that you can that's how you can determine punctuated a large scale um, uh, epigenetic uh, modifications in the genome so once you um, once you have generated this epigenetic data you have this process I, I hinted at earlier that's uh, the common thread through all the approaches you have to deal with quality control you have to align your reads or assemble your genomes. For, for ChIP-seq and um, our DNA methylation and uh, histone modification approaches, you then have to deal with um, a step called peak calling, where you look at your aligned reads and you determine if there's um, specific areas where you have um, large amounts of reads that you um, see in a specific sample, but not in a control sample. So you're looking for regions of interest where you see epigenetic um, activity. Once you have these regions identified, then you have um, pretty much your, your standard bioinformatics approach. You um, correlated with, um, with other omics approaches, especially um, 
transcriptomics, and um, you also do functional analysis and, and so on. Next step um, is motif discovery. So you have regions of interest. You want to see if there's uh, regulatory activity underneath these um, regions. And um, based on these regulatory activities, you can also um, generate uh, interesting signatures. <coughs> So a little bit, um, we wanted to focus in on, on peak calling. And what we saw is there's about uh, 75 different um, peak calling approaches. Um, they generally have different, um, a different focus in, based on their approach. And of course, they're, they're all the best for, for what they do. At least that's what they claim. And um, you, see, you will see a large variety um, for, for chip seek analysis, so transcription factor binding site discovery. Um, a large number of approaches for, for histone modification. So these are two, um, you have a, a, a large difference in, in their approach, transcription factor binding site discovery. So you have s sort of slender regions containing specific motifs. Histone modifications are much wider. So the um, algorithmic approaches um, differ um, considerably. And as I mentioned earlier as well, methylation site discovery, very punctuated. Um, uh, regions of interest that, that you want to look for. So the questions that we had looking at these 75 different approaches, which approach is best for, for a specific analysis? Are there correlations between different um, approaches? And um, once you see correlation between different approaches, um, is there correlation with existing data? So based on these questions we derived um, our hypothesis is that um, different approaches have different advantages, disadvantages, kind of makes sense. Um, integration of tools will provide a better evaluation and um, we, we determine that if we correlate the data we get out of these, out of these analyses, we'll get a deeper understanding um, of the overall experimental data. Our approach essentially um, is straightforward. What we wanted to do is we have a set of aligned reads, um, and we have a set of algorithmic approaches. These are the, the 75 tools I mentioned. Each of these um, has different input um, parameters in input format, so you have to have a format conversion for each of your um, aligned reads. They all generate um, peak lists, so the um, sites of interest for your um, epigenetic data that you deem relevant. Um, we correlate all this data and um, sort of spit it out saying um, in terms of Venn diagrams and so on, <coughs> these are interesting intersections. We can then filter those intersections based on known um, genomic locations. Um, ancestral repeats is one example, CPG islands is another one. And um, we also partition it based on the location of, of these peaks. So if they fall within a promoter of a gene or if they are um, specific to the, to the coding sequence. And when we correlate um, peaks or regions of interest, there are two, um, two approaches to do that. The first one, structural correlation, is pretty straightforward. Um, you have a, um, a genome, you have specific sites, you say, um, a peak or a site is the same if it's called by um, more than one tool. So here we have two um, sites. One is predicted by a tool called MAX. The other one is predicted by a tool called E-Range. They intersect. So you say um, this site is predicted by more than one tool or more than a number of user-specified tools. It's the same, same peak. Um, consequently, if they don't overlap, um, they're not the same and we discard them. One of the things, though, that we, um, we saw, because this has been done before and um, kind of is, is straightforward and, and trivial, we wanted to see is that um, we need to correlate them by intensity, too. So here I plotted um, the intensities associated with the predictions for co-located peaks. So each of these dots is a site that is discovered by both E-Range and Max. And you see down here, you see a whole list of um, peaks that have very, very low intensities um, predicted by one tool, but um, rather high intensities predicted by another tool. So the, the logic would be that these peaks differ significantly from one another. 
So we, we allow the user to um, sort of add another layer of uh, correlation and remove um, peaks that are um, not the same based on the intensity level. And um, the, the lab I'm currently working in is a, a wet lab. And the focus here is uh, hematopoiesis, so uh, formation of um, blood cellular components. And um, the idea that we do is uh, we do DNA methylation for four out of um, the 60 different cell types. I showed them here. So you have um, stem cells, and they, get, um, they differentiate to, towards um, red blood cells or platelets. And we picked um, four cell types. We looked at uh, the DNA methylation profiles. We used two replicates and um, one control. And what we see is that um, here we plotted um, five out of the 75 different tools. And you see there's a, a large vari variation between the number of sites they predict. So here for the stem cells, for example, with the E-range tool, we have about 65,000. Um, the MAX tool um, predicts a little more than 90,000, and um, MAX to around 86,000. So you see there's a lot of variation between the different tools. And generally what we could see is that um, MAX predicted um, more peaks than MAX2, than E-range, than Sizer. We saw a, um, a pattern for HSC has more peaks than CMP, than EOY. So these are the stem cells, a um, intermittent step in the differentiation process in the red blood cells. And you can see this pattern here for um, MAX and MAX2 and to a lesser degree in Sizer. But when you look at other things, so soul search, um, one of the tools is uh, contrary as a direct outlier. So um, this approach sort of lets you, lets you hone in on um, general patterns that you could find. When we correlated this data, so here we have um, two cell types, HSCs and the red blood cells, um, two tools, and we looked at um, the various combinations. So um, sites that only occurred in HSCs, only occurred in EOIs, or in, in both of them. And um, we looked at the, the different number of peaks. So you have about 86,000 um, for, for MAX, 61,000 for uh, Sizer. And of those 61,000 Sizer peaks, um, pretty much all of them were also contained within MAX. So our correlation studies lets you get a little bit of a better understanding what's called by the, by the different tools. And um, you see the same pattern throughout. And you can also see for HSCs, we have uh, 60,000 um, peaks. EOYs, we have 35. And if we look at both of them, we have still 33. So what we can determine from that is um, during the differentiation process, you demethylate. So the sites of methylation decrease during the differentiation process, and very little new methylation gets picked up on the way. And you can see that through all the different um, genomic partitions, so upstream, promoter regions, um, coding sequence, and um, downstream regions. And we also see a, um, a huge uh, spike in um, methylation for coding sequences um, as compared to um, promoter sequences. We looked at different benchmarks. Um, you may take that as you may. There's uh, benchmarking um, for um, peak calling is not that well established. There are two um, benchmarks out there at the moment that um, are applicable. Uh, Riot al does transcription factor binding, um, histone modifications done by Mixini. And um, what that allows us uh, is to, to query how well the tools do individually. And then we can see if we have an ensemble, if we start to add tools, we see here as an example our accuracy that increases uh, drastically. And we see the same uh, pattern for, different, uh, for, for other benchmarking metrics as well, so sensitivity and specificity. Um, conclusions, so we developed our six seeker tool um, as, a, as a framework for epigenetic data analysis. I showed um, our an ensemble peak calling techniques, but we have a similar thing for um, read alignment and um, other approaches as well. We 
sort of um, see the same patterns um, established in the literature in our case study. And um, we applied our case study to hematopoiesis, so blood cell differentiation. And um, another thing we could see adding tools to an ensemble sort of has the same um, power as adding um, biological or technical replicates. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. So, um, are there any questions for the speaker? So, uh, one question I had was, um, I mean, obviously the ENCODE uh, uh, project, ENCODE, has done a lot of work on, on trying to come up with some standard metrics, quality control metrics, and so on. Yeah. So do you take into account in this any of the ENCODE data yeah, sets? Yeah, so one of the things we, we do as um, a quality control step in our peak calling, we apply and um, clean our, our data. We remove those um, runs that wouldn't fall under the ENCODE guidelines. So if it has less than 1,000 predicted peaks, we discard that and we notify it there's something wrong with your, um, with your data at this point. And, um, so it's a little bit, a little bit of quality, well, quality control. Like yeah, this, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, we, we do have a quality control stage where we look at, where we use tools like FastQC and um, determine, OK, this data um, looks good, we allow you to trim, things like that. But when it comes to the peak calling stage that I, that I focused in here, we have um, the, we sort of have a filtering process so you don't include um, peak calling runs that were um, of bad quality, that you don't include that in the, in the further stages where you do the correlation. Okay. Um, all right, with that in mind, uh, thank you, speaker. And